You're listening to the Curiosity Collective podcast, and I'm Deepika. I've got the children to tend, the clothes to mend, the floor to mop, the food to shop, and then the chicken to fry, the baby to dry. I got company to feed, the garden to weed. I got the shirts to press, the tots to dress, the cane to be cut. I got to clean up this hut, then see about the sick, then the cotton to pick. That's the voice of Maya Angelou, poet and civil rights activist, reciting the poem Woman Work. A simple yet powerful poem about the constant, unending list of tasks that women undertake on a daily basis. I was listening to it a few days ago, and in the description of the endless list of domestic work, I felt as if she was describing my day, or my mother's day, or the days of so many women I know. Days filled with lists of to-dos that keep the home up and running. Now, as India draws to the end of phase four of the COVID-19 lockdown, Angelou's poem could just as well be about a woman's work during a pandemic. It feels immediate and present. When the closing of the external world has put a spotlight on the interiors of our homes, the place to which all of us have been consigned to for the past few months, Yet the disruption of support systems like domestic labour, on which India's middle and upper classes depend, has in many ways made this constant cycle of women's work in the home visible. Work that's otherwise not really seen as work because it's done by women. Quietly, routinely, constantly, habitually. Washing, cleaning, cooking, caring for the tots for older people, just everyday care work and much more. It's also, more importantly, made visible women from low-income and poorer households who do much of this work and who are often on the margins of conversations and labour, but for whom this income means survival. Now, there's still much research to be done in understanding the various facets of the impact that the lockdown has caused, but preliminary surveys are showing one thing quite clearly, that the impacts are highly unequal and exacerbate existing inequalities. Consider this recent survey research from the University of Cambridge on the impact of the lockdown, which clearly states, less educated workers and women are more affected by the crisis. Based on data sets from the US, UK and Germany, the survey points out that one potential reason for these gender differences is that women are spending more time homeschooling and caring for children. And this increased workload was also mirrored in a study conducted among middle-income Indians where they noted, survey results indicate that men have been more creative in finding alternative engagement methods, while women have had to cope with the additional workload at home, thus hinting at a possible reason for higher rates of mental health challenges among the latter. So what has been happening through the period of the lockdown that is leading to the situation? What are women experiencing And what might it mean for them? Seeing how some of these questions were uncomfortably lodged within my own very crowded home schedules, it made sense to begin unpacking them with the community of women I know. A 34-year-old Hyderabad-based Dvitya lives with her husband and has been working in the development sector for the past 10 years. She's currently employed with an organization that does research in the field of education which involves engaging with government schools in Telangana. A job that calls for about 10 days of travel every month. She described what her average day looked like before the lockdown started. So I had um, help who who was looking after um, cleaning the house as well as dishes. um, and And she would come only after I had left home. So a lot of the responsibility of managing her was was the husband's. So I didn't really think about that very much. I think I would have spent a couple of hours a day just with cooking, which is which is something I did every day, um, and maybe a few hours more, three four hours more over the weekend with clothes and dusting and and things like that. But not a lot of my day was taken up by this work, definitely. I didn't 
I, I kind of enjoyed it and did not necessarily think it was work, let's say. The majority of India's middle and upper class depends on the labor of service providers like domestic help, gardeners, drivers, and dhopis. In many cases, it also allows for women of this class to go out of the house and be employed in the formal sector, while still ensuring that the household functions, something which still continues to be socially deemed to be the job of a woman. In Mumbai, 40-year-old Kherni Sansari works as a domestic help in two homes in my neighborhood. She lives with her husband and two children, a 24-year-old daughter and a 19-year-old son. Her husband used to work as a driver till he suffered a stroke in 2019, which led to her son dropping out of college and staying home to care for him. Since he can't go out to work, the burden of running the household now falls on her. She describes what her average pre-lockdown day looked like. I was अपना घर का खाना बेना बच्चे लोगों को बना के टिफिन विफिन देके फिर मैं अपना घर का काम पूरा सफाई करके और काम पे चले जाते थे फिर वहां बाहर के दो घर का मैं काम करके आती थी फिर अपने आने के बाद मैं एक घंटा थोड़ा बैठ के उसके बाद में फिर शाम का अपना काम करती थी कपड़ा सुबह में नहीं धुलता था रात में मैं कपड़ा धुलती थी तो रात में मेरा काम पूरा कर लेती थी ताकि मुझे सुबह में काम पे जाने के लिए देरी न हो जाए When I asked Harunisa about the work she does at home she was initially dismissive of the question I mean, it was obvious surely that she did all the household tasks that go into its functioning, from the cooking to the cleaning to the washing. As development economist Jayati Ghosh at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi writes, women from poor families who are also engaged in outside work usually cannot afford to hire others to perform these tasks. So most often, these are passed on to young girls and elderly women within the household or become a double burden of work for such women. A few years ago, I was working with women living in slums in urban cities and in impoverished rural communities. And what was common across was that in both cases, the burden of household tasks fell on them. If they were employed in the formal or informal sector, some of these tasks were then done by the girls in the family. And as one adolescent girl said to me, if I have to fill water in the morning, cook and sweep the house, I can't make it to school on time. These things have to be done. Like all of 13, she was very clear that keeping house was the main priority. Now, for decades, this combined with fears about girls going out of the home and facing harassment has meant far lower access to school than boys. So deeply rooted is this notion of performing multiple roles that it's often not even seen as work by the women undertaking it. In Herunisa's description, there's a matter-of-factness about all the jobs she does and the roles that other members of her family play. It's something that I noticed I'd often do myself. Separate work as something external, out of the home, and a jobs for which I'd receive pay. Whereas everything I'd do at home was just things that needed to be done. Not work, just necessary tasks to function. And the multiple burdens that women carry is not a novel concept. Academic and anthropologist Caroline Moser first coined the term triple roles framework in the 1980s and studied the multiple kinds of work that women do. She captured the division of labor within a household and community by dividing women's work into three categories. Reproduction work, which includes household-related work, childcare, caring for the sick, and water and fuel-related work. The second arena of labor was production, which meant the work women put into farms or on producing marketable goods and services. And finally, women also bear the responsibilities of maintaining socio-cultural or community-based functions, such as work meant for the general well-being of communities, such as social events and community resource management. What the OECD, or the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, defines as unpaid work largely falls under this first category of a reproductive function. They say, All unpaid services provided within a household for its members, including care of persons, housework and voluntary community work. These activities are considered work because theoretically one could pay a third person to perform them. For Heronisa, who is often that third person for a few households, there's no escape from her own chores at home. An average day involves taking the responsibility that spans all three functions, or what Moser calls reproductive, productive, and sociocultural, 
whereas for her husband, it was limited largely to a productive role, and one to which monetary value was attached. Now for Dvitya, and many like her who are able to employ service providers, her pre-COVID everyday reality differed quite significantly. She was able to delegate some of her duties to her domestic help and didn't have to do these chores herself. Even so, she shared that even before the lockdown, she was still doing the mental labor of planning and scheduling and running the house. And she explained how this works with an example. So for for the most part, he has always managed the washing of the clothes, let's say. Um, and But this is one of the things that I complain, I don't know about if it's nitpicking so much, but... Despite the fact that possibly the work he would do, he would need the reminding. So I was doing the sort of the mental labor of remembering these things need to be done. Um, you know, otherwise, and if I would stop doing it, it would go on. We would possibly not wash clothes for a month. <laughs> so <clears throat> this thing of you need to remind me to do it somehow was was never I was never able to pass it on even if I was traveling I'd be like oh have you washed the clothes so in that sense I think um it was not necessarily the kind of sharing that you can forget about right I mean okay this is handled by someone else so I don't need to worry about it was was never um a thing I found myself nodding along in agreement with Vithya as she spoke of mental labor. That all too familiar, what almost feels like a default setting of remembering all the tasks that go into running a house and and then having to plan for it. You know, are there vegetables in the fridge to cook for dinner? Do we need a new tube of toothpaste? Is the detergent running out? Questions that we ask ourselves and actionables we put down on that ever-growing list of things to do. Now, it might even seem trivial, this ask of, can you remind me? But doing it day after day without respite has on many occasions left me feeling exhausted. And perhaps that's because implicit in being the person who remembers everything is the assumption that ultimately it's your job. Whereas the person being reminded is helping you fulfill your job. So you're never actually on an even footing. Now a few years ago I was in a job that involved extensive travel every month and I'd start my day often by sending a to-do list to my partner so I knew the basics would be covered even in my absence. And it would read, run a wash, call the electrician, drop off the check. And I'm not entirely sure how I reached that place or assumed that role. But when I looked around, even the women around me were doing the same thing. That continuous planning and management of the home in addition to doing all the other kinds of work they were doing. And it's something that made me pause and ask myself, where did I learn it? Was it something I was told? Or did I start to believe that that's how it's meant to be because it's what I saw in my own home, with my own mother or with my aunt? Because unlike women, the social pressure to take charge of that family to-do list is not an experience common to most men. Now, this mental load that falls on women has been well-researched in the social sciences since the 1980s. But because it's invisible, it's also difficult to assign a value to this work. And it therefore becomes easier for society to undervalue it because it's not socially recognized. From well before the pandemic, women have disproportionately shouldered unpaid care work, whether it's in caring for children, aging parents, or keeping the house up and running. According to a time-use survey published by the OECD in 2018, women in India spend up to 352 minutes, or six hours per day, on domestic work, compared to men who spend less than an hour per day. That's a whopping 577% more than men. And it isn't just about how much time is spent doing domestic work. It also means less time or a poverty of time that women face for activities such as learning or getting a job or for leisure or resting. Now with the ongoing lockdown, the workload for women has increased even more. And for many, this is mainly because of the disruption of the labor of service providers. Dvithya talks about her experience of life under lockdown and how her day has seen an increase in household work from two hours a day before the lockdown to five hours or more a day. I think one of the key things that changed was we we asked the help to not come anymore, um, which meant that everything 
had to be done i mean we had to manage all the all the work ourselves alongside cooking three times a day because uh, hyderabad is one of those places where delivery was food delivery was banned as well during the lockdown so there was little option in terms of not doing the cooking labor of this was we had no option but to do it at home i think what did happen is the work that goes into running the house um and keeping everybody fed and looked after was almost made visible by the lockdown because you don't necessarily see this i don't necessarily see how long it takes to to get the house cleaned and um dishes done and things like that so for both of us it made the work visible yeah, i mean and just yeah, husband offered to let's say help <laughs> um because it was i don't think he necessarily perceives it as his job to be done at all it's like i will do this so you have lesser to do kind of a thing men are now part of the conversation on when the dusting will be done dishes washed and plants watered something they'd never thought of before here is vitya says implicit in the offer of helping out or pitching in is this notion that it's not my business and the slew of memes and whatsapp forwards at the beginning of the lockdown indicate this one for instance said be nice to your wife restaurants are closed i mean so clearly having men participate a little bit more than before still doesn't mean it will lead to more or better distribution in the house rather the age old responsibility for it continues to remain with women and recognizing the greater workload the odisha chief minister put out an appeal that women shouldn't be overburdened by having to cook three meals a day for men while treating the lockdown as a holiday yet what remained absent from his address was the elephant in the room to directly urge men to participate and share in the slaver and make it their own it's an aspect that's unaddressed by many employers also who have this new fun enthusiasm for work from home without quite recognizing the challenges that it poses for women now when families include children and elderly members the workload also increases as month 2 of the lockdown began dwitya's household saw an additional member come into the home a 70 year old diabetic mother in law the change brought with it a new dynamic in terms of not only dealing with an additional member in the house but also having to renegotiate household chores with her husband in the context of her mother in law's expectations of the functions and roles that women and men perform in the home there had to be a change fairly immediately as soon as mom in law arrived um, mostly because uh, again mostly because of patriarchy and her saying that her son shouldn't be doing some of these things right um in the sense of that she would do the dishes instead of him or um not not even letting him do his own dishes for example so if if the husband is not going to do the dishes because because well he has a full time job apparently <laughs> i have to do them because you don't let your 70 year old mother in law do the dishes i felt unable to allocate some of the responsibility um to my husband and if we did if i did do it it often ended up becoming a disagreement between the two of them they would leave me out of it but they would fight about it so i kind of for the sake of let's everyone be okay and peaceful i think i ended up doing pretty much all the work and and that kind of annoyed me for many women the pandemic has made a couple of things happen first there's an increase in actual time spent doing unpaid care work and then there's the actual burden of the mental labor this involves in terms of planning and scheduling now a survey conducted by the lean in organization in the us backed this experience it says women are shouldering a much heavier burden of household labor and caregiving during covid-19 and it's taking a toll they're experiencing physical symptoms of stress and burnout at up to twice the rate of men Our findings also indicate that employers are providing limited support for employees who are trying to manage increased responsibilities at home during the pandemic. A closer look at their data showed among women and men who have full-time jobs, partners and children, women are spending an average of 7.4 more hours per week than men on childcare and 5.3 hours 
more caring for elderly or sick relatives. Most women are also spending at least seven more hours on men than housework. That adds up to a difference of about 20 hours per week. It's the equivalent of a part-time job. Now, for women of Latina and Black communities who are also economically more precarious, this number was higher, as it was for single women-run households. And then there's the emotional labor of having to suppress your own feelings and manage how other family members are feeling. First introduced in the 1980s by Arlie Hochschild in her book The Managed Heart, Hochschild described emotional labor as having to induce or suppress feeling in order to sustain the outward countenance that produces the proper state of mind in others. This role of managing the emotional needs of others is something that many women are familiar with. A sociologist, Rebecca J. Erickson at Akron University in Ohio says, The problem is that those expectations haven't changed since women entered the workforce. The belief that women primarily are in charge of and accountable for the emotional climate of the home is still part of the invisible work that women do. And part of the issue about that is that it's seen as something natural in women as opposed to something that takes time and energy and skill. What the lockdown showcases is that despite the increased entry of women into the workforce through the century and many, many laudable changes with regard to, you know, the perception of women's roles within society, the idea of the second shift, where women return from paid labor to unpaid labor at home, that still continues. It reminded me of that old quote I read somewhere, which goes, a man can work from sun to sun, but a woman's work is never done. Now, while women might finally be accessing paid work and the advantages that come with it, the fundamental structures that underpin the system, the division of labor across workspaces and home, continues to remain largely unchanged, irrespective of the class one comes from. And this in many ways shows how the winds of the past several decades are still very fragile. So when a disaster of any form strikes, the fault lines from under the feet of women can open up again, pushing back these really hard-won advances made through the past decades. So unless the structure and division of labor itself is reworked, women remain precariously perched on the edge and ready to be swallowed by the circumstances that overwhelm their time and energy. Yet class, of course, is not without significance in this conversation. For Kheru Nisa, the lockdown has affected her day differently in terms of how she spends her time. With the suspension of the work she does as a domestic worker, There's more time at hand, but with that also anxiety building around how to earn an income on which her family depends. Now there is a lockdown, there is no work at home, 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 there is no work at घर में रहते हैं लॉकडाउन में टेंशन ये हो रही है क्योंकि अभी घर का भाड़ा तो भरना ही है क्योंकि लॉकडाउन हो या कुछ भी हो घर वाला तो भाड़ा मांगना ही मांग ही रहा है और लाइट बिल तो देना ही है अभी लाइट बिल नहीं आया लेकिन बाद में तो एक साथ में आ ही जाएगा तो ये टेंशन है कि अगर लॉकडाउन जल्दी खुल जाए तो हम लोग अपने काम पर जाए तो घर का भाड़ा हम लोग दे सके और नहीं तो घर वाला बोलता है अगर भाड़ा तुम नहीं देगे तो रूम खाली कर दो तो ये तकलीफ हो जाए अगर हम खाली कर देंगे तो कहाँ जाएंगे Home for Kheronisa is an 8 by 10 foot room in a Mumbai slum that she shares with three other members of her family. She's housebound now, but as each day passes, it becomes more urgent to resume work so she can continue to live in the city. The pressures on her to support her family, a sick husband with mounting medical bills, along with her two children, are tremendous. And living on the margins with little savings, making her household function on the basis of day-to-day or monthly earnings that are disproportionate to the living costs of a city like Mumbai, makes her far more vulnerable to the whims of global or local disasters and the disruption that they bring. Now, previous studies on epidemics such as Ebola by scholars have found that the economic impact on women is far more significant than men. As women bear the brunt of caring for children, the sick and elderly, that unpaid work rises sharply. Further, as women are frontline healthcare workers, a job that's dismally paid with exacting demands and very little protection, they're also at higher risk. Even before the pandemic, 
women's participation in the workforce was already very low. According to the National Sample Survey Office, it saw a decline of 27% in 2011-12 from 34% in 1999-2000. With job losses already a reality, the effect on women will be far more severe than the 2008 recession. UN Secretary-General Antonio Guterres said, Nearly 60% of women around the world work in the informal economy, earning less, saving less, and at greater risk of falling into poverty. He added that the pandemic is having devastating social and economic consequences for women and girls. The poem I began with, Woman Work by Maya Angelou, has a second part to it following the listing of chores. And this bit is really deeply moving. Shine on me, sunshine. Rain on me, rain. Fall softly, dewdrops, and cool my brow again. Storm, blow me from here with your fiercest wind. Let me float across the sky till I can rest again. Till I can rest again followed by the endless listing of her chores and this heartbreaking tiredness, this utter loneliness, this almost hopeless articulation of escape that is possibly never to come. It's a poem filled with exhaustion, of toiling on and on endlessly, unrecognized, somehow like the labours of the earth, constant and unstopping. The yearning for release, the desire to unhinge oneself from the toil and float across the sky so that she can rest, It echoes across time and makes us question what has really changed since 1978 when the poem was written. The lockdown frames the four walls of our homes as a place of refuge, a place to retreat when all is not well with the world outside. Within its concrete, stone, brick, mortar, or even thin metal or plastic walls, it's the hope of the idea of shelter, of rest, comfort and care, even if it's for a little while. Yet as we retreat to these spaces in these times of uncertainty and stress, women still find themselves left out from that promise of refuge. Layer this experience of unending toil with the experiences of increased domestic violence which are being reported during this time, and inaccessibility to safe spaces or support systems, and we begin to see how structures of inequity are waiting underfoot to reassert themselves. The question remains, what should we do? Where do we go from here? Does it begin with recognizing different kinds of work women do? Making that conversation part of the everyday? Does it mean demanding that support structures are put in place? I wonder if this crisis will lead to more reflection, to greater equality. As with everything, I guess only time will tell. If you like this episode, please share it with your friends and family. You can also join our newsletter and social media spaces to explore further reading on the invisible work of women and how to begin to change the story. We would always love to hear from you at www.thecuriositycollective.org. Over the course of this month, we'll continue to explore lockdown and labor and the unfolding humanitarian crisis as millions of migrant workers try to make their way back home. This episode was made with the support of Srinidhi Raghavan and Arpita Joshi and was produced by the Bangalore Recording Company.